before we kick into the what could be, could you give us a little bit of a roundup of, I guess, what was for 2023 in the lending space? Absolutely, Todd. It's uh, sure been a real interesting year with uh, credit availability dropping off substantially. Uh, and yet we still see growth in the property market uh, nationally. So usually there's a decent correlation between credit and market performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the, the last 12 months in particular, as an example there, uh, where it's gone the other way, credit availability has dropped some 40%. From where it was, uh, you know, in the middle of COVID, there, uh, and we had substantially lower rates with the cash rate down uh, to almost zero. Now we see the cash rate uh, potentially at a at a peak of where it's headed uh, going forward, uh, and a few different things on the horizon. So, from my point of view, we see frustration, I suppose, across the market with investors looking to borrow and not being able to borrow what they want to, uh, in terms of borrowing capacity. Uh, the thing is, from a banking perspective, my observation is that there's never really been a better time to borrow money in the context of policy. So there's a lot of small things that have come in, into the market over the last 12 months, mm-hmm. things like banks introducing a one-year bonus policy, increasing their thresholds for online and AVM uh, valuations, uh, and the values that are coming back with property. Uh, as well as uh, a few little tweaks uh, around the edges to sort of uh, help the bank borrow uh, or, or allow investors to borrow a little bit more money. I've got to ask though, Richard, that, that feels like that doesn't line up. If you're saying it's what is it, lending has dropped by 40%, but there's never been a better time. How do those two things stick together? So I think the banks, are, you know, the banks have an appetite. They're keen to lend money out, but they're seeing obviously a reduction in borrowing capacity for, for borrowers. And they're seeing that people can't borrow as much as potentially they used to be able to. So uh, I guess it's a balance around managing risk uh, and trying to manage the amount that people can borrow. But certainly uh, they are doing what they can to make it easier. Uh, and you know, being able to find those little niche policies that um, that can help investors get that little bit extra borrowing capacity out. So basically, what I'm hearing with that then, Richard, is the 40% reduction is as far as people actually being able to borrow, but that's not the banks going. We don't want to lend you. Hence, the appetite for for banks, like you said, there's never been a better time, but they're still operating within the parameters that they're set to operate within. Is that right? That's exactly right. They're really keen to lend the money out, but mm-hmm. um, there's obviously very limited things that they can do to be able to assist borrowers to, to be able to borrow more. So they're doing what they can. Gotcha. All right. Why don't we jump into a few of the changes that could be coming in for 2023? I think some that already have, I think my, one of the text changes or actually no, it still hasn't come in yet. I think I'm, I might be living in the future a bit, but either way, why don't we jump into the changes and talk about how this could affect borrowing? Yeah. So there are a couple of really big things that I think have flown under the radar for a lot of investors that have come through in the last 12 months. So the first one is that um, there's a niche policy that a few of the major lenders have got around being able to refinance. Mm-hmm. Uh, and instead of having to deal with a 3% buffer on uh, that uh, assessment, the banks are now able to get these refinances through using only a 1% buffer for those refinance loans. That's huge. Absolutely. It, it pretty much overnight has, um, I guess, done what the intent was to release people out of what they were calling mortgage mortgage prison mm-hmm. uh, and being stuck with their existing lender, uh, potentially at higher rates and unable to refinance. So uh, the, the purpose, I think, releasing those mortgage prisoners uh, is obviously very important to deal with you know, cost of living issues and whatever else. Uh, But what it has uh, enabled a lot of investors to do is move from uh, potentially higher interest rate with non-banks back to the majors with a much better uh, interest rate Mm -hmm. uh, and also help them restructure their finances and their portfolio in a way where they're potentially then able to leverage into uh, an additional purchase. And what questions do people need to be asking their broker to find out if this is something that's really going to to help them? The best way is to talk to your broker holistically around what you're trying to achieve. So if you've got existing lending, you know, talk to your broker around what are the things that you can do to help optimize that Mm -hmm. to set you up in the best way to to achieve your objective. So if your objective is purely based on cash flow savings or cost savings, then you you can work towards that. Or if it's that you want to move towards extending your portfolio with another purchase, mm-hmm. then there's certain things that you can do as a broker to help restructure that finance, uh, extend loan terms, uh, potentially use a combination of interest-only lending, which 
some banks will do uh, under this niche policy Mm -hmm. uh, and then combine that with using a non-bank as an example, which uh, I'll run into as my next point uh, around one of the changes that's uh, happened in the last 12 months. And just before we get into the next point, so this first one here, this is one that has happened or is going to happen? Because this is sounding familiar. Yes, it, uh, it's definitely already happened. Uh, I think uh, you've had uh, the headlines of this on the show already, um, but I'm finding that a lot of people are not across it. Gotcha. Uh, and it's definitely something that as an investor, you want to have in your repertoire when it comes to uh, lending. Perfect. All right, what's the next point? So the next point is again around that buffer and uh, what's gone under the radar for a lot of investors is that there are non-banks out there that have broken away from APRA's guidance on having a 3% buffer. So um, there's different uh, grades of non-banks in terms of uh, who uh, has different products in the market. And there are lenders that are offering uh, as low as a 1% buffer on new money. So if you're looking to extend that investment portfolio and go with an additional purchase, then uh, that new money can be assessed at a uh, buffer of 1% instead of 3%. And they will also look at uh, actual repayments on your existing debts rather than those buffered repayments that the banks would need to look at. And how much is that changing serviceability by? Because that sounds like that's going to make a big dent. Absolute game changer if you uh, if you structure your existing lending the right way to be able to facilitate that borrowing, then yeah, it can mean you can purchase uh, you know potentially more than one additional investment property if it uh, if it's structured properly. Yeah, right. Okay, that's that's massive. And again, this is a change that has happened, not is going to happen? Correct. That's another change that has already happened. Um, again, it's it's slipped under the radar for a lot of people. Uh, a lot of people are not aware that that's a sort of more advanced and a slightly higher risk strategy that you can take mm-hmm. um, by, uh, by managing your finances in a certain way. Um, there is a unique opportunity here, though, I think, because when you start exploring these strategies, they are a little bit higher risk. They are complicated. And they do have risks associated with them. So where you can get stuck with these lenders that are at higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. Uh, So you need to think about, you know, what's on the horizon Mm -hmm. and what your exit strategy looks like to be able to potentially move out of these lenders at some point in time. And so if you combine these two, um, you know, finance changes that have already happened, you look at, okay, you could do a refinance with a 1% buffer back to a major after being in a non-bank for a defined period of time. Um, you know, some potential uh, synergy with those two changes. Uh, and then the other thing that we're overlay on top of that is if we look forward at what's to come in the next 12 months, there are a few big things that um, so some things will certainly change and some things will potentially change, which are going to increase serviceability uh, and be able to give investors um, that roadmap or that exit plan out of the non-bank world. All right. What's the first one on our potentially going to change? So everybody's talking about interest rates. We can fairly confidently articulate that we're uh, at the top of the cycle uh, in relation to interest rate increases. Mm -hmm. Uh, We should start to see them come down, depending on whose forecast you're looking at or or talking to, uh, toward the end of this year. Now, uh, there's a lot of different forecasts out there, but it should be somewhere in the realm of between one and three uh, decreases in the next 12 months, if it seems like the general consensus out in the market. Uh, and so that's obviously going to have a benefit to everybody in terms of reducing your existing uh, repayments, but it's also going to improve serviceability. So you, know, you could be looking at uh, an improvement there around five or six percent with um, you know two or three rate increases in play decreases. I was going to say decreases there. Eh? Yeah, <laughs> what, what, I know this is a crystal ball question. But what's your gut tell you? Do, do you reckon we're we're potentially going down what half a percent, a full percent? What are you what are you thinking? I suppose my gut feel is that it's not going to be as quick a reversal as a lot of people are forecasting. I think uh, it'll be a bit of a slow burn. With any luck, by the end of the year, in the later part of the year, we should see a 0.25 decrease. Uh, and then I would start to see it happening gradually over the course of uh, 2025. All right. So hopefully a, a bit of a, a decrease towards the end of the year. What do we got next as far as what's helping helping borrowing capacity, mate? What's been in the news recently, uh, the stage three tax cuts, they're due to come in the 1st of July. Yep. So um, I know there's been a lot of uh, discussion around uh, what they could have been and what they are, uh, but the reality is that they are going to help people, both in, both in terms of the cost of living uh, and also in terms of borrowing capacity. So 
if we look depending on what sort of income people have it should deliver somewhere in the realm of three to five percent improvement in your borrowing capacity three to five percent that's that's huge. I don't follow politics too closely because until they're held accountable for all the promises that they make, I'm, I'm just kind of sit on the sidelines. But I've, I don't understand that one. Why you didn't just come out and say, we're still working on it? Why do you commit to it? Because all the backlash that came back of this is what you said, now this is what it is. It's just like, it doesn't make any sense. But 3 to 5%, whether you're on team yay or team nay, as far as the cuts are concerned, it's making a pretty decent dent in, uh, in your borrowing capacity there. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's obviously good for pretty much everybody is going to be a good thing. It's always hard to speculate over exactly what will happen because you're dealing with politicians and uh, mm. and they're a pretty agile beast. Yeah, yeah, very much. Good at answering questions directly. But um, <laughs> what's the, the next potential change that we've got on the list there? So the third one is uh, that 3% buffer that we need to apply to, to new and existing lending, which is being uh, defined by APRA. So you would hypothesize that at some point in time, um, that buffer needs to be revisited. If we're looking at uh, new lending at 6 to 6.5% at the moment, mm-hmm. uh, we p- apply to the buffer of 3% on top of that. We're talking 9, 9.5% in terms of that assessed rate. I think where we are in terms of the rate cycle, um, it'd be extremely unlikely that we're going to see rates up that high. Mm -hmm. Um, And so from a risk management, uh, responsible lending perspective, I think it's probably too high. Um, And at some point in time, it needs to be addressed. Uh, And whether that's dropped from 3% to 2.5% where it was, um, or even 2% uh, prior to that, I think uh, either of those measures would be sensible uh, and obviously release uh, a bit more borrowing capacity into markets around that uh, five to seven percent uh, increase in borrowing capacity, depending on what that piece so, looks like. So we're adding up a few of these small percentages to making uh, quite a big change as far as the overall percentage is concerned. But for anyone that's maybe been running on the treadmill for the past ten minutes and zoned out a little, can we give a bit more of a holistic picture? Now I think you've done a bit of a John and Jim situation from two different incomes. What, what are the incomes that we're, we're basing these changes off of? Yeah, so we've got John uh, and we've got Jim. John and Jim are both uh, property investors and they're both rent vesting mm-hmm. uh, for the purpose of modeling up these numbers. This yep. is what we've used. So for John, um, he is on $90,000 a year as yep. PAYG yep. Uh, with his existing investment property. He would benefit in terms of borrowing capacity to the tune of 14% with those proposed changes. 14% difference. That's okay. That's huge. And what about Jim? What's Jim earning? So Jim is on a little bit of higher income. He's on $150,000 a year. Um, and obviously with um, a couple of investment properties as a rent investor, mm-hmm. but he would benefit even further with those proposed changes uh, to the tune of about 17%. 17. Okay. So, and this is where it's coming into the whole, like adding everything up these little one percenters, three percenters, they're all stacking up to some pretty big changes because if you can borrow an extra 17% into the market, we're starting to see how this potential boom could actually, again, I want to say potential, but potentially come to fruition. Yeah, correct. And I think, you know, experienced property experienced uh, property investors have seen market cycles before mm-hmm. and they've seen what happens when things start to get going. Uh, the FOMO comes back and, you know, the behavior and the media tends to drive the market even further and even faster. So uh, what we're seeing a lot of people explore at the moment is, well, how do you get into this market and get more exposure mm. before there's a potential jump on the market again? Uh, and that's where some of exploring some of those more advanced strategies around potentially using non-banks now to expand the portfolio and you know, restructure, prepare uh, and purchase that next property in a market, which is potentially a little bit quieter now yeah. than, than it might be if some of these changes come to fruition. That will give them the ability to move out of the non-bank uh, in the non distant future once borrowing capacity improves. Mm. So basically what I'm really hearing is sit down with your broker ask them these questions, talk about where your goal is, where you're really wanting to be and seeing how any of these potential changes could actually affect uh, your borrowing capacity moving forward. But jumping onto it, if again, if it aligns with your goals before the entire market does, because then that's when you're potentially going to see a, a better return out of it. Have I understood you right there? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's the, uh, 
the little unique window of opportunity here um, that if these things do crystallize, then mm-hmm. obviously that uh, has the ability to drive the market. And so getting in prior to that um, is definitely a good thing rather than having to buy on the back end when you're competing with everybody else. Awesome. Richard Morgan from Freedom Funding. Thank you so much for jumping on the show, mate. It's great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Todd. Pleasure.